left talking about the major changes that have happened uh, after the Balkan Wars, okay? And after the creation of the uh, Russian United Kingdom uh, untied. Now remember what we talked about in previous courses, okay? The great game, the rivalry between Russia and the United Kingdom and all of Asia was one of the major rivalries, one of the stable elements of international relations. And here we have the United Kingdom making the choice to group Russia. It's not that the UK is not scared of Russia, the office of the colonies, the colonial office still remains very much afraid of Russia and sees it as the greatest threat. It's the decision that they have to the conclusion that the only way to secure India is by allying with Russia and hoping to control Russian gains. And they decide that there are two, there is one place, two places where they're going to give Russia whatever it wants in return for Russia not bothering them anymore in Central Asia. That's the Balkans and the Caucasus. And as we said, the major change here is for the first time in a hundred years, Great Britain, who fought a war to maintain the Ottoman Empire, don't forget that, in the Crimean War, they fought a war to maintain the Ottoman Empire, has decided that it's okay if the Ottoman state is dissolved and if Russia even gets control of Constantinople, Istanbul, of the Straits. And in the Balkans, they're now okay with the dissolution of Austria-Hungary as a great power. This is a tectonic shift in politics as big as the old diplomatic revolution we talked about in the 18th century, when the Bourbons and the Habsburgs, enemies until then, came together to fight Prussia. It seems that Germans have a very bad habit of making people who hate each other become friends against them. Now, Wilhelm is completely oblivious to the seismic changes and is still fanatically trying to get England to become its ally by essentially acting like a moron internationally. Okay? And his idea is he's going to make sure France and England become enemies. He, he misunderstands, he misses. You know, this is the important thing when you're a politician. You have to be able to look beyond the headlines and to look beyond your prejudices. You have to be able to cast your eye in the real changes. He was left still in the era of the Fashoda crisis. He was still left in the era of French-British antagonism over a freaking oasis in the middle of the Nile. He did not understand that era was over. He was blind, he was an idiot. So thinking that things are the same as they were 20 years ago, he decides to cause a crisis in Africa in the hopes of pitting the French against the British. Okay? And he does that twice in the Morocco crisis of 1905 and 1911. Both, both times he fails. He pushes the Allies to the brink and every time Britain tells France, I've got your back. Well, Austria tells Germany, we're not willing to have a war over Morocco. The Balkans is important for us. <coughs> What's going on here is that Europe is not important. The story I've told you until now has been a story of European empires and European great powers and European states. 
It has been a Eurocentric story because until this point of history, the European states were the most powerful actors in the system by violence and force, by commerce and colonialism, by imperialism, they have conquered almost all of the planet. They have murdered, they have enslaved, they have raped, they have built schools, they have built universities, they have built roads, they have built transport, they have opened parts of the world to the new technology, and at the same time have imposed some of the most stupid ideologies of the world like racism. For all of this time, they have been the protagonists. Not anymore. You see, what's going on is that the United Kingdom, the preeminent of the European powers, but also the first global capitalist power, has come to a conclusion that Europe is of secondary importance. That the world is the prize. And it's okay to sacrifice elements of that European system. Countries in Europe, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the balance of power in Europe, to attain security and dominion over the whole world. My dear students, the end of Europe did not come in 1918. The end of Europe did not come in 1945. The end of Europe as a political protagonist of the globe came in 1911. Germany is not a global power. France is a global power. Russia is a global power. All of these global states can play. They are confident that they have a place in this new global era. But Germany and Austria, they're European powers. They're European states. They are literally seeing the world change in front of their eyes. And that means Germany is now so isolated, it has no choice but to be fully committed to its Austro-Hungarian ally. The most powerful state in Europe cannot think of another way to make itself relevant to the 20th century than by committing to the least powerful and least global of all the great powers. As a result, the two alliances become harder. On the one hand, we have the Triple Entente, the military alliance between France and Russia, a military understanding between France and Great Britain, and a political understanding between Russia and Great Britain. They're opposed by the military alliance called the Triple Alliance, including Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy. I mean, look how bad the conditions are for Germany. Their only allies are two states that are diametrically opposed to each other. The Italians want this part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They're your dentists. But with Wilhelm's foolishness, there are no other options. He has to choose second-rate allies. OK, what is Italy doing? Italy is the weakest of the great powers. It's weaker than Austria-Hungary. Uh, but it is the most, how can I say it, theatrical of the powers. You know, the Italians gave us the Italian comedy, the opera, a lot of it. They are a theatrical people, just like the Greeks, only they are more than the Greeks, population-wise. So Italy wants to be treated as a great power. It wants colonies, it wants respect. So its policy is essentially mercenary. It interferes in everything it can in the hope that it gets rewards. Okay? So despite the fact that it has territorial claims on Austria-Hungary, it allies with Germany and Austria-Hungary. Why? Well, for the Austrians, this is a group in alliance. They prefer to have the Italians inside their groups, hopefully controlling their irritation than outside. For the Germans, Italy has a navy. 
after France it has the strongest navy in the Mediterranean. Okay? <clears throat> For Italy, this is perfect. Just by saying, okay, I'll be your friend, it gets two great powers supporting it in everything it wants to do. I want to conquer Tripolitana from the Ottoman Empire. Yes, yes, we support you. I want to go and invade Somalia. Yes, yes, we support you. I want to beat up the Greeks in Albania. Yes, yes, we support you. This is literally it. Now, here is the reality. No one trusts anybody in this alliance. We know from the documents that the Germans and the Austrians did not trust the Italians. They thought that in case of a great power war, Italy would definitely not become an active ally. But they didn't care. All they wanted Italy was to stay neutral. Because they thought that if there was a war, it would finish very fast. So, you know, we defeat the French and the Russians, and then we go to the Italians and say, Hey, mi amico, we have a problem here, okay? Macaroni Inter. That was in the past. So let's go to the war. Okay. Some of the things that happened in March 1914. Okay. The triumvirate of the Ottoman Empire, okay, uh, came to power. That was when they solidified their power through the, oh, sorry. Through, their, through the so-called election of clubs, okay? Essentially, the CUP went around and beat the crap out of anybody not voting CUP. In France, Madame Calius, wife of ex-French Prime Minister Etienne Calius, goes to the offices of the newspaper Le Figaro, asks to see the editor-in-chief, and when he comes in to see her, she calls up, takes a gun out of her hand purse and shoots him multiple times. It's over a sex scandal. Yes, even back then they were like about it. And in Chicago, at St. Patrick's Day, for the first time in the history of the world, they make the beer green. If you go to America on St. Patrick's Day and you go to Chicago, literally the beer is green. It tastes disgusting. But okay, it's Irish looking. And a couple of days, months later, in a quiet provincial city called Sarajevo, Gavrilo Princip, a Serbian young nationalist, shoots Franz Ferdinand and leads to an epic rap battle. So get ready to be rapped. We are really, you know, at the cusp of technology in this class. All the best music for you guys. <laughs> Let's see what it works.
Edward Burke, William Neary, the armies of the two long tongues, mighty Roger, France of this bitch, lighting the rhymes of the shovels, your rhymes of the gamble, you're taking an enormous punt. The word by her is and yours true. Think you're a massive, difficult chap. You're to the toilet of mission from stars in this position, so go ahead, cards, rent, and ready. You will then to be stuck like a floating junk while the attack you lose the wings. Your heads are fresh as they're still sucking drops of Kendallic stench. As we all drive in long space and goodbye, I'll let your name be used to pray for Sakra Pai. Gotta send my thoughts from Belgium into France. Nothing can stop this Teutonic advance. Germany will rise again like the past. A glorious empire built to last. Let me tell you this ain't no mystery. Wilhelm the Great will go down in history. Wilhelm the Great, boy, really no danger. I mean, it's absurd. He ain't built to a wonder. He's not the choice. He won't be there even. some unthought crazy stunt. There was more than enough time to think. And while it's true that the Serbian uh, war begins again a month later, why, why not use this one month to resolve this peacefully? Okay? One explanation is the so-called Fischer thesis. This was developed by a German historian in the 1960s, and his argument is that these three people, Kaiser Wilhelm II, you know him, Moltke the Younger, he is the nephew of the guy in the video that says this is disgusting to Bismarck, uh, and he is the quartermaster general of the German Imperial Army, he's the chief of staff. And Theobald Batman Holloway, he's the chancellor. And the Fisher thesis is that these three people, representing the alliance of Iron and Rye, had decided that Russia's power was going to increase so much in the future that Germany had to fight a war now rather than later. So according to the Fisher thesis, these three men pushed for the war. They pushed Austria to be harsh on Serbia, and they on purpose picked a fight with Russia. Different thesis is the one that was put forward by Vladimir Lenin over here. Vladimir Lenin was the founder of the uh, Russian Soviet Socialist Federated Republics that then becomes a USSR, a great revolutionary, ruthless politician, killed a lot of people, liberated supposedly other people, whatever, you decide whatever you want with this. Vladimir Lenin said that the cause of the war was the competition of the great powers over colonies. Now, a criticism to his thesis was that, well, remember the two alliances? All of the colonial powers are on the same side. The great global competitors are France, England, and Russia. Russia doesn't have colonies. Germany has some jokes of colonies. So it doesn't work perfectly. 
But on the other hand, remember this. England allied with Russia because of its colonial empire. So in this sense, it is true that the colonial competition played an important role in driving England to give unconditional support to the Russians in the Balkans. Other people like Trevor Schneider say, oh, it was a tragedy, it was unavoidable. Okay, the anarchical structure of the international system leads to wars. Okay, there's a balance of power. That balance of power gets changed because of differential growth, as Lemke and Organsky say, and Kugler. And there's power transition. The power transition leads to war. So you will have great power wars every now and then in the international system. Uh, and no one can really be blamed for the war, none of the decision makers, because they have to operate in a specific international system. I argue differently. The new historiography done over the last 20 years has unearthed three important things. First of all, countries have agency. And you cannot see Austria's decision as simply Germany pushing it around. The Germans, the Serbians, and the Russians all had their own goals that fed into the war. Secondly, there is literally a terrorist organization active here. The Black Hand is a terrorist organization. There are so massive similarities between the start of World War I and the Afghanistan War. Think about it, OK? World War I, a terrorist organization situated in another country with ties to its governments murders commits an act of terrorism in another great power. Then the great power declares war to punish the country that hosts the terrorist organization, Serbia. United States, 9-11 happens, right? There is a terrorist attack. The terrorists there are affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is situated in Afghanistan and protected by the Taliban regime. So the United States of America goes to war in Afghanistan and still there, the war is still being going on, um, over that. The similarities are immense as the consequences for the international system. Third, domestic politics are important for all the great powers. None of these decision makers were free from opposition within their country. So the new historiography focuses on all of these factors. Okay, you can actually change the question from why did World War I happen to two different questions. First of all, why did the serbian austrian war happen? Because this war started as a war between Austria, Hungary, and Serbia. It only became a European and world war afterwards. So the two things are different. There are reasons why the war between Austria and Serbia was permitted to happen, and then there are reasons why that war was permitted to escalate. Part of it is the systemic structure. As we've talked in this class, one of the things that happened in the last 50 years in our history was the collapse of the Congo system. Okay? Napoleon III was able to destroy it, then the wars of German unification finished it off, Bismarck failed to create a credible replacement. So what this meant is that in Europe, there wasn't any system that could permit the great powers to resolve their differences in a cooperative <coughs> manner. Which means that, well, if the only way you can get what's rightfully yours is by beating the crap somebody, you're going to beat the crap out of somebody. If there's an ability to go to court, then you're going to go to court. If there's an ability to arbitrate, you're going to arbitrate. The more options you have to resolve a difference, the less likely you are to use violence. The fewer options you have, violence is always an option. It's the ultimate option. It never goes away. Secondly, the alliance is created to fill in that lack of the Congress system were extremely dangerous because they were unilateral alliances, adversarial. Not only were these alliances not included in all the major powers, but they were openly targeting other major powers. They were offensive alliances.
Secondly, we've seen that the last 10 years of the history of Europe, especially in the Balkans, was one of repeated crises. Serbia, 1903, Morocco, 1905, Bosnia, 1908, 1909, Second Moroccan Crisis, 1911, the Balkan Wars, the Lehman von Sanders Crisis, 1913, that's when Lehman von Sanders was brought to the Ottoman Empire to head a military mission. Russia almost went to war. In every one of these cases, a great power mobilized and threatened war. Now, here's the important thing. War was avoided. You know, when somebody tells you World War I was predetermined to happen, well, you had more than enough opportunities to fight it. And yet, time after time, war was avoided. So it's wrong to say it was unavoidable since those great powers had avoided it before. But the way they avoided war before was problematic. They didn't avoid war by uh, cooperation or compromise. They avoided it by threats. One side turning in the other, and then one of the allies blinking. So for example, Austria threatened in Serbia, Serbia is asking Russia, can I stand up? And Russia is saying no. Or Russia threatened in Austria. Austria is talking to the Germans and saying, will you stand up for me? And Germany is saying no. France, everybody. And the result of this is that all of the allies did not fully trust their allies. There was a continuous fear that those allies would betray them. Add to this the character of the territorial disputes. You see this map over here? This is what Serbian nationalists believed is rightfully theirs from the Austro-Hungarian Empire. There can be no compromise when the other side claims one third of your state. Okay? That territorial conflict added to the rivalries between Austria-Hungary and Russia for the Balkans, Germany and Russia over the Ottoman Empire, and Russia and the United Kingdom over the Central Asia. So these competitions fed each other. The moment that Britain decided to resolve this issue by grouping Russia meant that these two rivalries became deterministic of all international relations. As long as Britain and Russia were enemies, there was space to cooperate, cross-sectional cooperation. But when Britain decided to accept grouping Russia, that went away. What about power transition? There was, there's a difference between what is actually happening in the world and what we think is happening. This is why statistics is important. Getting accurate data is important. And the reality of the matter is that in 1914, key decision makers of Europe thought that Russia would become the most powerful state in Europe in 1917. Okay? The Germans feared that what was actually going on was this. While in reality, Germany retained a military preponderance over Russia. But the reality was not important. The image was important. And they thought that this graph, this is the military power of Germany, this is the military power of Russia. They thought that this graph was going like this. And it's going to open more. And then Russia will attack. The reality was that that was not the case. What was the case was that Russia was becoming more powerful or equally powerful to a point with England. And that is what made the British so worried about the colonial empire. If you see here, the red is the power of Great Britain, the blue is the power of Russia. It's very close by. Towards the end of the year, the British go become more powerful because they enter into a massive naval program due to their rivalry with Germany. There are two, two power transitions that were actual. Germany did become more powerful economically than Great Britain. 
Okay? Though it was unable to translate that power into naval might. The great naval race, the attempt of Wilhelm to build a navy that would scare the British, failed. By 1914, the British had built almost double the number of dreadnought battleships than the Germans. They knew they had lost. But they still believed that they were strong enough to force a resolution in Europe in their interest. And finally, there were the two countries that you didn't need to have perceptions. The reality was the world was weaker. France, red, was much weaker than Germany. Austria, Blue was much weaker than Russia. So these two countries had every reason to need the support of their allies, which means that they had every reason to act in ways that would persuade their allies that they were committed to them. This is important because by 1914, Germany was scared that Austria would defect because Germany had not supposedly supported it enough against Serbia in the Balkan Wars. Austria was afraid that Germany would defect and make an alliance with Russia, which was what they used to have under Bismarck. The French were scared that Russia would betray them and come to an agreement with Germany because they thought they were becoming weaker. And France had failed to support Russia in the Balkan Wars, England was terrified of Russia defecting and coming an ally with Germany because that would completely destroy the ability of the British to secure their empire. Everybody fundamentally was scared that everybody else was going to leave them all alone. So they were now willing to do anything to persuade their lovers, or their allies, sorry. Same thing, that they are loyal. To this, you can feed ideology and history. Serbia and Russia had a very close relation because of pan-Slavism. By 1914, important elements of the Russian royal family, including three cousins and brothers of the Tsar, were ardent Serbo files. They wanted to see Austria-Hungary destroyed. Okay? France and Germany, remember, they had a small issue called Alsace-Lorraine. And while revanche was not exactly driving French policy, there was a popular, a popular view in France that war with Germany was inevitable and righteous. Politically, domestic politics everywhere was dangerous. In Serbia, you had on one hand Ragudin Dimitritevich, leader of the Black Hand, also known as Apis, conspiratorial, okay? Leader of a secret organization and also one of the people who murdered the Serbian king in 1903, opposed by the Prime Minister Nicolas Pasic. With the engrandment of Serbia in 1913 in the Balkan Wars, there was a debate on whether the new territories will be ruled by military law and under the control of him, or were they going to be incorporated into normal civil law of Serbia and controlled by the Prime Minister. By 1914, these two actors were in a collision course, and in Serbian politics back then, this always ends with somebody murdered. One of these two men would have to die, but the result was that Passage was very scared and afraid of accommodating Austria-Hungary during the crisis because if he accommodated Austria-Hungary, he was scared legitimately he would be killed by Serbian nationalists. They just killed the Austrian heir. They wouldn't have a problem to kill a Serbian prime minister. So that forces Serbia to be less accommodative than it could be. In Austria-Hungary, you have a division between a war party and a peace party. On the war party, the leadership is Konrad von Hotzendorf. If you watch the Great War series, you will learn a lot about him. Who essentially starts World War I partly so he can marry a married woman. I'm not kidding you, look it up. 
He believes the world will permit him to grab the love of his life from her boring husband and marry her as a leader. By the way, he actually succeeds in doing that. The war might be lost for his country, but he gets the girl in the end. He is also supported by people like Oscar Poitorek and other militaries who want to fight Serbia and want to destroy it. They are opposed by two people, Franz Ferdinand, the heir of the Austro-Hungarian throne, who actually put Hodzadov in his position, but by now hated him, and Istvan Tisa, the Prime Minister of Hungary, who simply has no intention of fighting Serbia and including more Slavs in his empire because he hates Slavs. And he's also worried that if there's a war, Romania is going to ally with Russia, and well, Hungary is in the way of the Russian armies, not Austria. Well, guess what happens in August, in June 28, 1914? He gets killed. Which means that the war party now is dominant and they are able to persuade Count Bredholt, the foreign minister, and one of the richest men in Europe at the time, filthy rich, to persuade Franz Joseph to go to war. Okay? In Germany, it's complicated. Moltke really wants war. He wants war with Russia. By the way, the war by, with Russia means first war with France. Because well, France and Russia are allies, and the Germans have decided that all oh, the French are pushovers because we defeated them in 1871. Remember what I'm telling you here, you know, don't let your prejudices guide your policy. Don't think because you beat somebody up easily once that it's going to happen again. They think France is the easy target. So in any case of a German-Russian war, Germany must first attack France. Even if France wants to be neutral, Germany must attack it. So he's pushing for war, and he's opposed by Bethman Holwig, who wants to keep the war localized, and actually proposes that what the Austrians do is they bombard Belgrade, they take it, and then there's a peace treaty and a congress. At the same time, Willy is trying to show his statement by personally trying to resolve issues. He sends a bunch of telegrams to Tsar Nicholas. They call the Willy Nicky ones because they actually call each other Willy Nicky. I'm not kidding. You can look up the documents yourself. My dear Willy, I hope we have peace. My dear Nicky, can you back down on there? My dear Willy, I don't think I can do it. My dear Nicky, what will our grandmother says? My dear Willy, I don't think you have any right to say anything about the grandmother. Blah, blah, blah. blah. War, war. These three people are not really coordinating. He hates him because this chancellor actually tries to make Germany a more responsible government. He wants to keep him out of the picture because, well, he's a moron. So what happens is they undermine diplomacy. And once diplomacy fails, he's, he walks in and he is like, well, my Kaiser, everything has failed. So you have to give me the word. There is actually a scene where the Kaiser believes there's a last chance to avoid the war because some idiot in Britain, by mistake, insinuates that Britain might be willing to stay neutral in case of a war. But Germany has already mobilized, so all of the armies are moving towards France. The Kaiser tells Moltke, we have to stop the mobilization. England is going to persuade France to be neutral. He send all the trains back to Russia. Moke says, mobilizations are not some kind of plaything you can just stop when it starts. They start yelling at each other because they're Germans and we already saw how Bismarck does it. And the Kaiser goes like, if your uncle was alive, he will give me options. And Moke says, goes out very angry. He almost had a stroke. Uh, and then he comes in and the Kaiser says, diplomacy failed. I'm very sorry. And they say, okay, we'll do a war and we'll all be better. <coughs> in France, there's a divide between left and right. This uh, is accentuated by a competition between the bureaucracy and the prime minister and the president. The president, unfortunately, is Raymond Poincaré, who is a very interesting character, but is very willing to go to war. He's from Alsace Lorraine, by the way. 
So that's one of the reasons. And he feels that he has to act to support Russia against Germany because if he doesn't, he will lose elections and his government to the left. So he's afraid of the rise of the left. In Russia, again, there's a war party and a peace party. In Russia, the war party is much more powerful. It includes people like Zelensky, the commander-in-chief of the army, Sukhomilov, the chief of staff, Kirov Shenin, the agricultural minister, and they're pushing for war. And they're opposed by Vladimir Kokovots, who says, no war, Russia needs time to reform. But by 1913, the foreign minister, Sergei Sazonov, decides to throw in his lot with this guy. So they're able to persuade Nicholas II to fire him. Which means that the peace party in Russia is gone. And there's a strong willingness for war. Let me give you an example. This guy here of Shenin, do you know what he told people on the day that Russia started mobilization? He was asked by some Duma members what's going on, and he said to them, trust us, gentlemen. Everything will be great. This kind of people. While well, in the United Kingdom, there was a very serious issue called Irish Home Rule. The Irish are demanding their own parliament, OK? But there is a powerful Protestant minority in Ireland which is opposed to be ruled by a Catholic majority from Dublin. And by 1914, the Liberal Party in power is pushing for home rule. And the Unionists are threatening civil war. The war liberals, led by Edward Grey, who are determined to keep the alliance with Russia, and are a minority within the Liberal Party, which is mostly made up of pacifist people who don't want a world war, unite with Henry Wilson and the war tourists, who see a war in Europe as a way to put the question of Irish Home Rule away. And together, they're able to form a majority that pushes the majority liberals out and leads Great Britain to war. Finally, a lot of these people have psychological issues. If you sit down and you read their writings, you see indicators of depression. Uh, Bethard Holder characteristically said, I can see that one day my hometown in Prussia is going to be overrun by the Russian hordes and all of my trees will be cut down and destroyed. Some of them had this sense of honor, which precluded them accommodating, because they were like, I'm an honorable man. An honorable man do not make peace. A lot of them were apocalyptic. For example, Beth, for, for example, the color of Hotsov knew that the war could destroy the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But you know what he said? Well, we're going to be destroyed anyway because of the stupid socialists. They were scared that the socialists are going to take over Europe. Uh, in Germany as well. So they thought, well, let's have a war anyway, because the war might destroy socialism. I'm not kidding you. This is actual arguments made by people who push for the war. Okay? Some of them have mood swings. Wilhelm II, literally, different mood for every hour. And some of them were just lazy. Tsar Nicholas II had no idea what his decisions meant because he was too lazy to care about learning what they were about. And thus, the war happened. Luck was not on the side of Europe. If France Ferdinand had not been murdered, it's highly unlikely Austria-Hungary would have gone to war with Serbia. In 1911, Pyotr Stolypin, a reformist authoritarian prime minister of Russia, was also murdered. Stolypin was absolutely opposed to any war that involved Russia for the next 20 years because he said we need 20 years of peace to reform our economy. So two of the most powerful voices opposed to a great power of war in Europe are dead. The end result is that, my dear students, war happens because people that want war to happen come to dominate the decision. 
there's no accident, there's no, I, I didn't think what will happen, make no mistake, war is always a conscious choice. By 1914, in all of the great powers, the war parties, the blue line, outnumbered decisively the peace parties. Europe was led by people who wanted a world war. Are you surprised that they got what they wanted? Could the war have been avoided? These are interesting. There were chances for it to, uh, to be avoided, but it's what if. Let's leave it for today. To give you an idea of the kind... Okay, so that explains why political leaders wanted the war. Why did the populations go along with them? Part of it was, well, a lot of them were peasants, and peasants are used to life being hard. They were not supporting the war, but they accepted that bad things happen. Those who weren't peasants, those who were educated, well, a lot of them were filled by nationalism. And songs like these were taught to every kid in school in Europe, at least since the 1880s. Ces cartes, ce point noir qu'il faut effacer. De tes petits doigts, tu l'écartes. En rouge, il vaut mieux le tracer. Plus tard, quoi que le sort te fasse, promets-moi bien d'aller là-bas chercher les enfants de l'Alsace qui nous tournent leurs petits bras. Puis, en notre chère France, les rameaux verts de l'espérance, fleurir par toi, mon cher enfant. Grandis, grandis. To rid the map of every trace of Germany and of the Hun, we must exterminate that race. We must not leave a single one. Heed not their children's cries. Their slay or now, the woman too, or else some day again they'll rise. But if they're dead, they cannot do. Ein Feind ist unser und einer allein. Schon meistens der Deutschlands Grabstein. Voll aus. Ist ein Busen voller Neid und voll Pein. Ein Feind ist unser und einer allein. Nun hebt der Frevler die Meuche an. Sein Name kennt sie. Ist Englisch. This is literally the kind of thing. Okay, let's. So I left you at the break. With the start of the World War, we're gonna go through the whole World War briefly. Don't worry, briefly. And we're going to end the class with the end of the war. So, let's start with 1914. Don't be scared of the war. The war has erupted, okay? Serbia, Russia, France, uh, the United Kingdom, and Belgium are at war with Austria-Hungary and Germany. Uh, quite quickly, both sides try to win over Italy, which declares itself neutral to the war, as everybody expected. And in order to get Italy to come to their side, both sides offer it promises. The central powers offer gains in the Balkans, Albania, parts of Greece, and in North Africa and the Ottoman Empire. So yes, the central powers are already offering part <coughs> of their future ally to get Italy. The Entente offers gains against Austria in the Balkans and the Ottoman Empire. Italy decides to stay out of it for the time being, trying to see how it plays out. In Asia, Japan, uh, as part of its alliance with the United Kingdom, declares war on Germany and attacks the uh, German colonies in China and the Pacific. For the Japanese, it is totally an opportunistic attack, a chance to essentially get territory since the Germans and the Austrians pretty much cannot defend their colonial empire anymore. Both sides try to get Bulgaria to enter the war. Since if Bulgaria enters the war, it could either destroy Serbia by outflanking it, or if it became an ally of the Entente, it could even get Romania and Greece to enter the side of the Entente and create a powerful Balkan front that will destroy the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
The Central Powers offer Bulgaria, Serbia, and Greek territory, essentially what is today the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. The Antan Powers offer Serbian, Greek, and Ottoman territory again. The Ottoman Empire is kind of like something everybody offers. The king of Montenegro would have preferred to remain neutral since he saw Serbia as a threat to his own independence. But he rules a kingdom that has a lot of pro-Serbian nationalists, so he is forced to join the war on the side of Serbia. The Antan also tries to get Greece to enter the war. He offers gains against the Ottomans, Bulgarians, and Serbians. But this leads to a division in Greece between, on one hand, the king, King Constantine, who is a bridegroom of the Kaiser, is married to his, to his sister, and also somebody who was educated in the German military academies and is very pro-German and prefers neutrality, and the Greek Prime Minister Eleftherios Venizelos, who wishes to enter the war because he believes Greece's future is tied to the great naval powers, which are France and England. The war happens as this. The Germans uh, invade Belgium as part of the Schlieffen plan, hoping to defeat France very quickly. Uh, they overrun Belgium, but ultimately they are defeated by the French, the Belgians, and the British at the Battle of the Marne. Then both sides essentially try to outflank each other by going towards the sea until they actually reach the sea. The battle literally stops at the edge of the sea. With no ability to outflank each other, they start digging trenches. In the east, Russia invades Prussia, which is almost not defended at all because all of the German army is busy fighting the French. But at the Battle of Tannenberg, Max Hoffmann and Ludendorff and Hindenburg, Hindenburg defeat the Russians in a massive victory. Then in, uh, the Germans counterattack and they conquer Russian Poland. In the Balkans, the Russians attack the Serbians and are defeated, while the Russians take Galicia from Austria. Pretty much, if you want to use one word to characterize the war events of 1914, it is failure. Everybody's well-laid plans for a quick war fail. The German attempt to knock out France before having to fight <coughs> Russia fails. The Russian plan to take Berlin in a quick move Fails. The Austrian attempt to win a quick victory over Serbia fails. They all expected a fast war, but instead what they see is that first of all, modern warfare is very deadly. Within the first 10 days of the war, something close to one year of the war, something close to a million people are already dead in the battlefields. And they see that the massive armies created are not able to be defeated. So the Schlieffen plan was essentially run through Belgium and then attack the French armies that will be attacking into Alsace-Lorraine from the back. Okay? It's not a bad plan, but it was simply beyond the capacity of the German army. They were stopped somewhere here. And then the two sides started trying to outflank each other until they reached the sea. In the Eastern Front, the Russians attack, trying to get to Berlin, but they're defeated at Tannenberg. And then the Germans conquer most of this area, most of modern Poland. Here they take Galicia. Here they fail taking Belgrade. So 1915 enters and the war is still going on. Driven by the hope of breaking the stalemate in the West, both sides become more intensified in their attempts to win allies. Since it becomes very quickly that you cannot break trench lines with massive infantry attacks, they think we can win the war by opening new fronts. Italy Finally, allies with the Entente. It wants Austrian territory in return. All of coastal Croatia, Tyrol, Trieste, Albania, territories in the Ottoman Empire, and more colonies in Africa. That is the price that the allies have to pay to get Italy to attack Austria-Hungary. 
What do we? So battles from the central powers. But on the other hand, Bulgaria allies with the central powers, promised Serbian and Greek territory. Finally, the Ottoman Empire, understanding that whatever happens, it's likely to lose territory to satisfy somebody, decides to throw its lot with the central powers, correctly understanding that Russia is the biggest threat, but also essentially making a massive risk by choosing this side that seems more powerful, but long term might not be. They were angry at Britain for its policy concerning navy. The British had promised to help the Ottomans build a better navy, they refused. They are promised territory in the Balkans, but immediately in the Middle East. And for specific members of the Committee of Union Progress, like Talat Bey, this is a great opportunity to get rid of the Armenian political threat to the Ottoman Empire, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation. In Greece, all of these events exacerbate the division between the king and prime minister Venizelos, which slowly becomes something more than just a difference between two politicians, but more like a civil war condition. In the West, in 1915, the Allies launched a number of frontal offensives trying to break through the trench lines. All of them failed with massive losses and trench warfare became the norm. <coughs> the Italians attack Austria-Hungary to great fanfare. Everybody thinks Italy is going to succeed and they get badly defeated. They fail miserably. They fight four battles of these songs. Not one, not two. Not three, but four battles in the same area trying to break through, and they fail every time. In the east, the Germans launch a great offensive that is extremely successful, though the Russians are largely able to retreat <coughs> and their army. The consequence of this is political. Tsar Nicholas II decides that his brother, who is a competent but not brilliant military commander, is at fault for this. So he fires Nikolai, Nikolai, which is his brother, sends him to the Caucasus to fight the Ottomans, and he takes personal command of the Russian war machine in the West. That is a catastrophic <laughs> choice, because Nicholas II is incompetent as a military commander. Uh, the Austrians participated in the great Central Power Eastern Offensive, but they did badly. They failed, pretty much. The Allies attack the Ottomans at the Dardanelles and Gallipoli, thinking that they can take the Gallipoli Straits and knock out the empire from the war by taking Istanbul. However, it fails miserably. You see, in the initial planning, at the same time that the Entente was going to attack from the Gallipoli front, Russia was supposed to attack from the Black Sea. The Russians were supposed to land a massive army up in Chile and the other area on the eastern side and march from Istanbul from there. However, the Russians said, well, we have trouble after the fact. After the Allies had already committed to Gallipoli, they said, oh, we can't help you there. But we're there. They tried to persuade the Greeks to make up for the loss of the Russians. But Greece was so divided politically that it was impossible. Now, in the Caucasus, Enver Pasha is able to initially defeat a, a Russian offensive and then decides to make a counteroffensive to retake Kars and Adrahan, which were parts of the Ottoman Empire that had been taken by the Russians in 1877. This attack fails completely at the Battle of Sarikamish, and Enver Pasha, in trying to save his political ass from fire, blames it all on the Armenians. This is used as an excuse by those members of the Committee of Union Progress that considered the Armenian population a threat as the starting to start deporting them from where they live towards Syria, where they think they will be not a danger to the Ottomans. These deportations, in turn, spark Armenian insurrections in places like Van and Bitlis, and the end result is ethnic warfare over there. Now, Bulgaria, 
Austria and Germany together, like bros, attack Serbia from everywhere and, of course, defeat it. But the Serbian army is able to escape in Greece, which creates extra tensions between King Constantine and Prime Minister Venizelos. Uh, at the same time, with the failure of the Gallipoli campaign, the Allies are seeking a place to park their army, and they take advantage of the Greek situation, and both the Allies and the Bulgarians violate Greek neutrality and send their troops into Greece and start fighting in Greece. In both cases, there's a claim there was no agreement by the Greek army, but in reality, is Prime Minister Venizelos had said okay to the Anglo French entry, <coughs> and then when he fell, the next government had said okay to the Bulgarian entry. Here's the Western Front. They are actually making a park where you could one day walk all the way from Switzerland to the North Sea through the battlefields. This is the Western Front, the red areas where, where the great offensives happened in 1915. So one day, one of you might be lucky enough to drive their bike all the way from Switzerland to the North Sea. I hope you get a chance. It should be fun. In the East, as you can see, the German offensive has been very, very successful. But down here, where the Austrians were supposed to take care of things, as you can see, they've been stuck still within Galicia. In the Balkans, the Austrians have pushed south, but they haven't been able to take Serbia yet. But with the entry of Bulgaria, the Bulgarians essentially attack the Serbians from here and force them out of the country. Now, we enter 1916. The attempt to win the war by focusing on secondary fronts, the Balkans, Mesopotamia, all have failed. Largely speaking, both sides hold their uh, positions. Thanks to the Bulgarian entry into the war, the, um, the Central Powers have gained an immensely powerful position in Central Europe. On the other hand, they still face the reality of a two-front war. The Entente is able to get Romania to ally with itself. Romania has demands on Austria and is also uh, demanding Bulgarian territory. The Romanians chose a very bad time to do this. They thought that the Russians would support them by a great attack. Unfortunately, the Russians and the Romanians do not coordinate. So what happens is Romania ends up having to fight by itself, Austria, Germany, and Bulgaria, and is badly defeated. In Greece, you really have a civil war, an Allied invasion. South Greece becomes occupied, while North Greece is under Prime Minister Venizelos, who creates a rebel government called the National Defense, which enters the war on the side of the Allies. And Greece enters what is called the Great Schism or the Hasmos, where essentially every Greek is either a Venizelist or a Constantinist, and they hate each other more than they hate anybody else in the world. This is going to have a big impact later on in the history of Turkey. <coughs> 1916, in the Western Front, the Germans launched the Verdun Offensive. Okay? The plan here is brilliant. The idea was of Quartermaster General Erich von Falkenheim, and was essentially the way to win in the West is to bleed France dry. So we're going to attack this area in Verdun, which is important uh, for the French, and what's going to happen is we're going to force the French to put more and more troops there, and we're going to kill them. We're going to bomb them, we're going to gas them, we're going to kill as many French soldiers as we can. So France will bleed dry, its army will not be able to replace itself, they'll have to surrender. While they do this, the British launch a great offensive at Somme, hoping to take advantage of the Battle of Verdun to break through. The German plan works greatly. The French lose lots of men. The problem is that the Germans themselves become focused on Verdun. And they start feeding more and more troops into what was supposed to be a diversion. So both sides are essentially throwing away their lives for an area that is not that important. 
So all of them fail, and the stalemate continues. The Austrians launch a massive offensive under Conrad von Holtendorf uh, against the Italians, and they are very successful, and the Italian counterattacks fail, and that's the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th Battle of Isonzo. So we already had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 battles in the same area, Isonzo, okay? In the Eastern Front, after careful preparation, using some of the most innovative new tactics that everybody has learned from two years of war, and under the command of the brilliant General Brusilov, the Russians launch a massive military attack against Germany and Austria. This is very successful. It comes very close to breaking the Carpathian barrier and leading to Cossacks having their breakfast in Budapest. If that had happened, the Hungarian government would have broken and surrendered rather than face the destruction of its heartland. Very successful, but it fails. Why? Because while Brusilov is making his attack in the south, the other Russian generals who were supposed to attack Germany in the north are too late. They start too late, which permits the Germans to defeat them in detail and then turn against Brusilov. The Balkan and the Caucasus, as I said, Romania is quickly overrun by the Central Powers, so it is able to fall the line. And Bulgarian and German troops are holding up the Allied army in the city of the Saloniki, Salonika, Salonik, where they call them the gardeners. Or as one German commander said, the greatest free prisoner of war camp Germany has ever had, since 400,000 Allied troops are busy just in Salamnik rather than fighting somewhere else. The Ottoman army of the Caucasus is destroyed by the Russians, who are very successful. The massive Russian counterattack breaks through and takes the city of Trebizond. Essentially, at the end of 1916, there is nothing between Trebizond and Istanbul. There is not one Ottoman army available. The Russians have all of Anatolia open. As a result of this, the ethnic cleansing against Muslims in the Caucasus by the Russians and the Armenians increases, and the ethnic cleansing, which is called the genocide outside of Turkey against the Armenians, also increase. By the end of this process, one third to 40% of the Armenians of the Ottoman Empire will be dead, and about 20 to 30% of the Muslims of Eastern Anatolia are going to be dead. This is the Western Front. Verdun is over here. You see? This is where Falkenhayn thought he would bleed France to death. The Somme <coughs> offensive is over here. Both fail. That's what they get. This is the territorial increase. We're talking about millions of men fed into here, and all they get is some little tiny parcel of land. Here's the situation in the Eastern Front. The Brusilov offensive starts here but is able to drive all the way here, okay, before it collapses. In the Italian front, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 battles of the Sozo. This is the territory taken by the Austrians in the Great Offensive. Balkan front, this is how Serbia collapses. You can see how useful Bulgaria is to the Central Powers. This is how Romania collapses. Bulgaria was a great ally in this sense. With one country, they got rid of three other countries in the Balkans. The problem, though, is that Bulgarians don't want to fight anywhere else but in Macedonia. They don't care about the Greater War. So their armies just park here and start smoking. Here's the Caucasus campaign. This is the territory controlled by the Russians by the end of 1916. This is Trebizond. There is, again, I have to say this, there is no Ottoman army left here. There are Ottoman armies down here, okay, fighting against the Mesopotamian and the Palestine campaigns of the Allies. There are Ottoman armies fighting Romania, but there are literally no Ottoman armies left in Anatolia. The reason is simple, railways. The Ottoman Empire does not have the railway logistical network to move its armies around. 
Once an army is posted somewhere, it takes a year to move it. So the powerful armies that fought at Gallipoli and Chanagale, all they can do is smoke cigarettes while the army of the Caucasus is destroyed. Indeed, in the end, the Germans say, why don't you just send some of these guys to Galicia? So my good friend Onur's great-grandfather ended up fighting Romanians and Russians in Galicia. And at the end of the war, he actually walked all the way from Galicia back to Istanbul. Think about that as a hard life. Why is there no peace? We are two years into this war. Millions have died. Nothing has been succeeded. Well, the main reason is the war aims. As millions have died, no government feels that they can make peace without somehow justifying those sacrifices. And how can you justify the sacrifices? By great gains. The central powers, they want to end the war, changing the map of Europe. Bulgaria, getting what is today the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia and most of Serbia. Okay? Germany getting a protectorate over Ukraine and Belarus, and also directly putting under German control the Baltic states and Finland. Okay? Austria-Hungary regaining northern Italy, Venetia, gaining Albania, and turning Montenegro and whatever is left of Serbia into protectorates, while Romania is uh, shared between the two sides. The Ottoman Empire gaining the Western Aegean Islands over here, regaining Tripolitana over here, and in the east, gaining territory in Persia, the state of Azerbaijan, and Kars Ardahan. So these are, these are games that cannot be attained without destroying the Russian Empire. The Ottomans hope for vengeance in Tikhan. This is a propaganda poster from 1914 for the losses of the <coughs> Balkan Wars. But the Atant also has maximalist gains. This is what France would like the world to look like. Look, look what we're talking about. Austria-Hungary is dissolved. Romania, Bulgaria get massive territory. Okay? Uh, Germany is dissolved. Instead of Germany, you have a whole bunch of states. Also, the French get the right bank of the Rhine, going back to neutral, to the natural borders, OK? The Ottoman Empire is dissolved. A state of Turkey is created here in Ankara. The Greeks get Izmir. Istanbul is given to the Russians. This is given to the Italians. This is given to the French. The English get and the Russians get the Caucasus. So, to get this kind of a map, you have to destroy Germany and Austria-Hungary. You have to completely eliminate them as states. The Russian and British and French uh, claims in the Middle East are known as the sykes picot Agreement. Actually, the correct term is sykes picot sazonov Because Russian Foreign Minister Sazonov played a crucial role. You all know this map, but let me explain how massive the change would have been. The Greece would have got an ID. Italy would have gotten a zone of influence or control of Italia. France would have gotten over here. And Russia would have gotten the Caucasus and Istanbul. The British agreed to Russia controlling the Straits. By the way, there's no Armenian state, and there's no Armenian state because the Russians never intended to make an Armenian state. We now know that at most the Armenians will have been permitted cultural autonomy, but nothing more. So all that fighting was essentially for getting ruled by a Russian in the end. This plan keeps on happening, but with the Russian events we're going to talk about, they have to replace it. If you take all of the war aims together in one thing, what you understand is that everybody considered that the only way they could justify the massive losses in this war was by reshaping the map of Europe fundamentally. 
No one was willing to go back to the old borders. It has entered 1917. The situation, France, Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire, and Russia are all exhausted. They have reached the limit of their military capability. Their armies are fighting, but their economies are essentially almost destroyed. No alliance has gained the upper hand. They're still making the West. German Austrian successes in the Balkans are countered by Russian and British successes in the Middle East and the Caucasus. Germany is engaged in a new type of warfare, a very desperate type, called unrestricted submarine warfare, where they essentially sink any neutral ships caught in specific international waters, which pieces off the Americans like crazy because most of those neutral ships are American. Finally, the German colonial empire is destroyed. Unrestricted warfare has a negative effect on German relations with America. And these are compounded by stupid uh, policy. So why no peace? One, as I said, sunk costs. Everybody is thinking, we lost so many lives, we put so much effort, we can't give up without getting something for that. This is the most dangerous type of thinking in international relations. The Vietnam War is partly explained by that. The Americans will continue to go we spend too much money, too many lives, we have to win. We spend too much money, too many lives, we have to win until you lose. Secondly, as you saw, the goals of everybody are maximalist. They require the destruction of great powers. Great powers are great powers for a reason. They can stand in war for a very long period. While all of the other allies are exhausted, Germany and England are still able to furnish massive military armies and support. While the United States is providing massive economic resources to the Antarctic. And fourth, everybody thinks the next victory is going to be the one that works. Everybody believes that. They hope that the next victory is going to be the successful <coughs> one. But what happened in the previous one was bad luck, incompetence, not something structural. 1917, the United States and Brazil declare war on Germany and enter the war on the side of the Antarctic. But the United States is not an ally of the Antarctic. Instead, it's a cold religion. This is going to be important for the peace treaties. Uh, there is hunger over German submarine warfare, and there's a lot of money in the Antarctic by the Americans, so they can't afford to lose their investment. And finally, there's the ideology of democratic republicanism. They see Germany as an enemy of democracy. In Greece, Venizelos, with the support of the Allies, is finally able to dominate Greece. The king is exiled, and with force, Venizelos makes the country fully on war on the side of the Antan. In Russia, the defeats of the Great Pursuit of Offensive, the economic stagnation, the exhaustion lead to a revolution, the February Revolution, which is headed by moderate elements of the establishment. So this is a revolution from the top. They force the Tsar to abdicate. And a new republic is declared under the rule of Kerensky, who is a social democrat or a socialist. But Kerensky makes a big mistake. Unwilling to lose the support of the Allies, especially for economic reasons, he decides to continue the war, a very unpopular decision for a lot of the people. He is able to persuade the Russian people to put one last effort in his Kerensky offensive, but that fails completely. And with the failure of that offensive, a small party that has become bigger thanks to the war, the Bolshevik party, is able to launch a revolution or a coup d'etat, you choose your word, in October and declare a new state, a Soviet state, the first socialist state since the Paris Commune of 1871. But the result of this coup or revolution is that the Russian armies stop caring about the war. Russia enters a period of civil war and revolution, just as it was about to win the world war. Ladies and gentlemen, my dear students, think about this. Russia, the Tsars, had come so close 
into attaining the goals which Catherine the Great had sought 200 years ago. There was literally nothing between Istanbul and Trabzon. The Russian armies could march all the way to Constantinople, burn the city to the ground, and no one would stop them. But right at the cusp of victory, Nemesis hit. Revolution happened, and those armies started marching back home. The Western Front, <coughs> the French, under General Neville, who promises extraordinary things, launched the great naval offensives which fail miserably and lead to massive mutinies by the French army that simply refuses to attack anymore. As one of the generals that replaces Neville said, from now on we're going to stay defensive and we'll wait for the Americans to come. The French army is done with attacking by itself. The British also large offenses in support, but they also fail. In Italy, two more battles of the Isons have happened. Yes, 10th and 11th. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 battles of the Isonzo. Okay? I mean, this Isonzo area is so perfect. People want to die in it all the time. Um, fail. And in the 12th battle of the Isonzo, the Austro Germans defeat the Italians, drag them all the way back outside of Venice. In face with these collapses of military command, the Allies make a decisive political move. Until now, every Allied army had its own commanders and would only take orders from its own government. And they would coordinate, if they were able to coordinate, as things happened. Now the Allied Prime Ministers decide that this cannot go on. And they create a supreme command under the French Marshal Joff and make, is it so? No, Foch. Oh, I don't remember right now. Watch the series. Anyway, they make a central command which now helps coordinate the four Allied armies. In the Eastern and Caucasus Front, as we said, the defeat of Akrensky uh, offensive leads to collapse. The Germans launch their own Riga offensive and it's very successful. They QA huge amounts of land. In the Caucasus, the Russian army just leaves, leaving Armenians, Georgians, Karadenis, Rum, and Muslims to kill each other over the whatever is left off. In the Balkans, nothing happens. There are some attacks by the Allies that are defeated. And in Mesopotamia, Middle East, there is an armored revolt which starts to affect the ability of the Ottomans to hold back the increasing British pressure. As you can see, the Western Front does not move around, but in the Eastern Front, oof, look at that. Okay? That's the territory taken by the Central Powers after the failure of the Kerensky Offensive. Okay? Ukraine especially is important because Ukraine has wheat, food. In Italy, this is how bad the Italians are forced in the 12th battle of the East Ocean. Catastrophic defeat. War diplomacy in 1918. 1918 enters as the high point, and we're almost done, as you can guess from the dates, of the Central Powers. With the treaties of Brest-Litovsk, Bucharest, and Batum, the Central Powers attain peace in the East. Okay? The territorial changes are massive. Okay? Why did the Russians, why did the Soviets agree to this? Well, because Lenin thought, screw it, we'll sign whatever they want. In a month, there's going to be a Soviet revolution in Germany, and we will renegotiate everything, because now we will all be Soviet Bolsheviks. That's the reason. They also don't have an army. Germany gains these, either as direct territorial protectorates. Austria gains these, either as direct territorial protectorates. The Ottoman Empire gains these other as direct territory or protectorates. They won. They won in the East. Okay, can we make peace now? No. The Allies are not going to make any peace. US President Wilson uh, puts out his uh, historical 14 points. I'm not going to read them right now because there are a lot. You can read them out. But mainly he calls for a new way of doing politics 
One based on capitalism, free trade, and the idea that national minorities and national groups should have their own states. An idea that directly threatens Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. What they really meant is this, the potential complete dissolution of Austria and the Ottomans, the creation of a Polish state, which is anathema to Russia, Germany, and Austria. The end of the Straits question, because from now on the Straits cannot be closed at times of war by anybody. And the end of cabinet diplomacy, a system of public diplomacy, and a liberal nationalist democratic Vienna system, perhaps? You can see. The Western Front, after the collapse of Russia, Ludendorff, now the person who really leads Germany, is able to move massive German armies from the east and use them to attack in these five great offensives, the Ludendorff offensives. The goal is to knock out France before the Americans arrive. Because the Americans don't have an army, they have to build an army from the start, so it's going to take time. They fail. And the German army is completely exhausted. The Allies counterattack with state-of-the-art technology, tanks, aeroplanes, and state-of-the-art finally innovative thinking. And in a number of battles called the St. Mikhail Offensive, they overrun the German positions. The German army is not able to win anymore. Ludendorff gives up. He surrounds, he gives up, he resigns while mutinies and revolution in Germany lead the Kaiser to abdicate and create a new Republican government which asks for an armistice. In the Italian front, the Austrians lead, start the war the year with an offensive which fails. And then the Italians together with the Allies make a massive counter-offensive at the Battle of Vittorio Veneto and defeat the, Italian, the Austrians. Austria collapses because in the Balkan front and Mesopotamian front, the Allies are able to finally break through. In the Battle of Mexico, Syria is opened up to the Allies and through Syria, Anatolia. In Selanik, the Allies break through and force Bulgaria to surrender. This is the extent of the territory conquered in the Great Allied. For the first time in three years, you actually see this map moving and massively. In Italy, the Italian attack by the end has reached into Austrian territory and the Austrian army has collapsed. And in the Balkans, as you can see, it's destruction. Once the front falls, nothing is there to hold back. Mesopotamia, the Allies reach Sur, okay, and are able to now break into Anatolia. So here's the question. When the year started, great powers, the central powers, were at the height of their power. And within 360 days and less, they're defeated. Why? First of all, while the German army was well taken care of, the German population was suffering hunger and war weariness. A powerful English blockade had denied Germany the ability to use a lot of foodstuffs. The hope that the Germans had that they could use Ukrainian food to feed their starving population failed because a civil war erupted in all of that area. <coughs> it would just take too long. And the peace of Bread Litzkos did not actually bring peace to this. The Germans still have to keep armies to police their new territories. In Austria, Hungary, the Czechs and the Hungarians become disillusioned with the empire. The Czechs are the oldest people of the Austrian Empire, and the Hungarians are, well, half of the imperial government. The Ottoman Empire is beset by political strife and national revolts. Bulgaria is exhausted. Bulgaria has been fighting almost continuously since 1912. It had the largest mobilization in the world. 25, close to 30% of the Bulgarian population fought in the war. There's nothing left. And all this is happening. And over the horizon, on the other side of the Atlantic, 
a five million man army is preparing to land in Europe. Finally, the German military commanders, knowing that they're going to lose the war if it continues, and wanting to avoid being associated with a clear military defeat, decide that it's better to negotiate here so they can blame the civilians of losing the war. So what's the human cost? 68 million men were mobilized in the army that fought in World War I. That's more than all armies mobilized in European history in the previous 300 years. In just those five years, four and a half years, more men went to war than had gone to war in Europe in the rest of our class. Okay? 10 million soldiers died. 21 million were wounded. 6.6 million civilians died. The war cost 300 billion US dollars. To make things even worse, the end of the war coincides with the great Spanish flu epidemic, which kills 50 million people worldwide. By the end of 1918, 120 million human beings have died in the space of four and a half years. The war is a global catastrophe. We're going to stop here because we got to see how do you make a new world out of the literal ruin of the old one? Any questions? Okay, everybody, I'll see you next week.